morning, everyone. How y'all doing? Fair enough. Um, any questions, concerns, needs, etc. before we get started today? about chapter 7. This is going to start about two weeks and two chapters on rotational motion. We began last time by looking at the introductory concepts of rotational motion, just kind of defining, defining how we define rotational motion. Uh, what we're going to be doing this week is continuing to look at the basics of rotation, continuing to define, look at how we define it, and then as the week goes into next week, we'll be looking at more advanced applications of it, looking at weirder places, weirder concepts where rotation occurs. Um, what we did last time is we were defining those angular rotational con uh, concepts. We kind of compared rotation directly back to linear motion in that displacement, velocity, acceleration, all the ways we describe linear motion still apply to angular rotational motion. We just kind of have to shift our perspective from thinking about meters forwards to thinking about radians rotated. You still have displacement, the amount of rotation. You have angular velocity, how quickly you are rotating. Angular acceleration, if, if your rate of rotation is changing. And Formula 3 and 4 have angular counterparts as well, where you just replace all the linear stuff with the angular stuff. So all the same logic applies. We're going to keep applying the rotational stuff back to the linear stuff. Today, we're actually going to focus specifically on the concept of centripetal force and centripetal acceleration. That's the main focus of today, because lab this week is going to involve centripetal force and centripetal acceleration. So, building upon these basics, continuing to describe rotational motion and its various quirks. Uh, once again, any questions or needs from you guys before we dive into that specific thing? All right, so, we talked a little bit about rotational motion. There's a specific type of rotational motion that we're going to focus on first. And uh, I want you to look at each of these pictures and try to think about what they all have in common. First, we have a can rotating about this child's hand tied to a string. I can replicate this basic act using this tool. It's a plunger tied to a force gauge with a little handhold that I can use. So this basic process, just swinging something by a string overhead, kind of similar to a old fashioned slingshot, David and Goliath style. Next, we have the moon orbiting the earth. And lastly, we have a bunch of cars turning in a circle, just constantly, perpetually turned to the right, going in a circle, insert NASCAR joke. What is it, what do all three of these scenarios have in common? There's an axis. There's multiple axes involved, actually, because these objects are kind of moving both linearly and rotationally at the same time. Uh, they aren't, strictly speaking, moving forwards, but they are, like if we consider in this case, the ground to be an XY plane, the cars are moving west here, north here, east here, and south here. So they're moving in pretty much every possible direction on that 2D plane. They are moving through linear space while also rotating. So one interesting thing here is that linear and rotational motion are both happening simultaneously. We are moving XY plane meters forward and backward in different directions but we are also moving rotationally. So that is one observation. It's all circular. The motion that is created is all circular, 
Uh, I'll point out that these objects are moving circularly around something, around a point that is not a part of themselves. When I spin this tire, and I'm just holding the axle in place, it's, only, it's spinning in place. It's rotating about its own center axle, but it's not going anywhere, right? This is an example of rotational motion happening by itself. No linear motion, just rotation. These, again, are interesting hybrid scenarios. We've got linear 2D motion and also rotation happening at the same time. And the objects aren't rotating about their own center axis. They're rotating about something else. They are orbiting something else. The can is orbiting this child's hand. The moon is literally orbiting the Earth. And all these cars are orbiting about some invisible point at the middle of the circle. So, multiple axes involved, linear and rotational motion happening at the same time, but the method of rotational motion is unique because they are all orbiting points outside of themselves. Any other quick observations before I elaborate a little bit? Now, We talked about momentum last week, the notion that objects once moving want to keep moving at the same speed in the same direction, right? Matter has been doing that for as long as we've been calculating with mass in this class. Inertia says an object wants to keep doing what it's already doing. Momentum says an object wants to keep moving in the same direction at the same speed forever. So do these objects want to move in a circle? No, they want, if left alone, to move in a straight line. Matter kind of inherently wants to move in a straight line. If you throw something forward, it's gonna keep going forward until something forces it to change. And more specifically, if this was happening and someone snapped that string, what would the can do if the string didn't exist? It'd take off in a straight line. Once again, that's how old school slingshots would work. You'd physically put a rock at the end of the sling, spin it around, and then once it was moved, like once it was at this point, technically trying to move forward, you'd let go and it would just go forward once there's no longer anything forcing it to move in a circle. In every single one of these cases, the objects all want to move in a straight line, but something is forcing them to move in a circle. And in this class, force is what forces things. There is literally a force, measurable in Newtons, causing all of these things to happen. All these objects are orbiting about some central point, and they are being forced to do so by a force. Normally they wouldn't do that. They would have their own velocity and try to move in a straight line. But while they are trying to move in the straight line, there is also a force. And that force, interestingly, always points towards the center of the orbit. In this case, what force would cause this to happen? Looking at the picture, what, what name would we use for the force causing the can to do this? Momentum. Say it again. Momentum. Momentum is not a force. Tension, because it's a string, right? If this, this string is the only thing keeping an object doing this, if the string snapped, the, the plunger or the can would just go away, right? The string is what's forcing the objects to undergo this motion, and when a string exerts force, we tend to call that tension. Notice, though, tension has to point inward on both ends. So the tension might be pulling you know, this way on my hand, but it pulls the opposite direction on the plunger. That. It has to pull into the rope. And that's true no matter what direction the rope is at, right? So no matter what part of the circle this thing is in, the tension is always gonna pull towards my hand from the, uh, the plunger or the can's perspective. 
that tension from this object's perspective always points towards the center of the orbit. It may constantly be changing direction, but it's always pointing towards the center. Whoops. The same is true here. What force causes the moon to orbit the Earth? Gravity. And by definition, gravity always pulls mass towards the center of mass. Earth's gravity is trying to pull the moon towards the center of the Earth. So that's going to pull the moon this way towards the center of its orbital pattern. The moon specifically orbits the center of the planet. And then here, the same thing is happening. It's just a little harder to describe because traction on the ground is an interesting science. So I'm just going to explain it. Um, in any car, normally if the wheel is straight, you go straight. But when you turn the wheel, you also change the direction of the tires, which changes not only the direction of the applied force to the ground, it also changes the direction of friction from the ground. And that combination of factors creates a net force inward towards the center of the circle. And that's true if you're doing a full donut like this, but it's even true if you're just going through a partial circle. Because whenever you turn, you are temporarily entering a circle. It may only be well, a fourth of that circle, but it's still part of a larger invisible circle. You enter it here, and you exit it here when you put the wheel back. And that entire time that you are in that circle, there is a force pulling you towards its center, accelerating you towards its center for as long as you are engaged in that motion. So in all of these scenarios, there is an object orbiting a point outside of itself because of a force pulling it towards the center of that orbit. There is, in each of these cases, some force making this happen. And that's what we're learning on today. The force that is making this happen. We call that centripetal force. You guys heard that word before? It's fair enough if you haven't. I'm just curious is all. So these objects are accelerating in a circle. They are accelerating. And what's causing that circular acceleration is known as centripetal force. I don't always do this, but I kind of want to look at the root words in that word, century and petal. I think they're Latin. Century means center, and petal means seeking. So centripetal force is the center seeking force. In all those earlier pictures, I said there's a force pulling towards the center of the orbit. So some force has to serve as a centripetal force to make this happen. And centripetal force is just what we call whichever force is currently playing that part. Because similarly from the previous slide, a bunch of different forces were playing that part. You had tension for this thing, you have gravity for the moon around the Earth, and for the cars, you've got, again, a combination of engine force and friction. So different forces play the role of centripetal force. So this is kind of an interesting concept in that, you know, gravity always has one specific formula. It always acts in a certain way. Uh, tension always has its own specific quirks. But centripetal force is weird in that any other force can play the part of centripetal force. It's like a role in a movie, and you have to cast an actor to play it. Here they cast gravity. Here they cast tension. Here they cast combination friction and engine force. So that's one thing that makes centripetal force unique, is that it's a role that any force can play as long as it will continuously point to the center of a circular orbit. That's the, that's the only requirement. And once that centripetal force is acting, it causes centripetal acceleration. Because when these objects are moving in these circles like this, they are accelerating, even if their speed doesn't change. I don't recommend doing this, but if you are driving a car, you can choose to not hit the brake while you turn, right? You can choose to keep your foot on the gas and crank the wheel. 
I don't recommend it, but you can choose to do that. And when you do that, the speedometer will stay the same while you are changing direction, right? Again, don't try that. I'm just using it as an example. In that scenario, the speedometer stays the same, and that means that your speed stays the same. But your velocity still changes, because velocity is a vector, meaning it cares about direction. I'm, again, referring to this as kind of like a bird's eye view of a car turning left, looking down from above. Before you crank the wheel, your velocity points forward. And after you turn it, you're technically going to decelerate in the y and accelerate in the x until you get here where your y velocity is zero and your x velocity is negative something. So even if the speedometer doesn't change, velocity changes because you are accelerating. You're switching axes, you're changing direction. And changing direction does still mean change in velocity, since it's a vector. Therefore, changing direction means acceleration. Centripetal force causes centripetal acceleration. And for any object to move in a circle, which is to say it is orbiting at a specific radius from a central point, that's why it's R, radius of a big imaginary circle. There has to be a certain amount of centripetal acceleration for the car to take that turn to move to rotate at that radius at any given speed. And that acceleration is caused by a centripetal force acting upon the object's mass. So this is kind of a modified version of Newton's second law. Centripetal force equals mass times centripetal acceleration. The subscript C stands for centripetal or centripetal acceleration centripetal. Centripetal force causes centripetal acceleration. Centripetal acceleration is going to cause the object's velocity to keep changing direction as long as it is rotating in a circle of a fixed radius. The radius would again be distance between the object and the center of whatever point it is orbiting. For the car, that would be the distance between you and the imaginary center of the giant circle you're forming. For the moon orbiting of the Earth, That radius would actually be the distance between the centers of the two rocks, since gravity is causing this and gravity cares about the distance of center of mass to center of mass. And in this case, the radius would just be the length of the string, unless I physically change that radius but it's always the distance from center orbit to the object, or the center of the object. And the V is its linear speed, the speed that it wants to move at in a straight line, but is being prevented from doing that. And since the object is moving in a circle, we can describe its motion rotationally. We could talk about how many radians it's moving through, or say rotations per minute as an alternative unit. So there is a variation of the formula that uses the new angular velocity variable instead. It would just be omega times r instead of linear v squared over r. So two different versions, just kind of depending on which mode you're thinking in or which version of velocity you happen to know. In the moon's case, that linear v would be the speed it wants to move at in a straight line which would be a very big number. The moon is moving very fast, many times the speed of sound through space. But its angular speed is actually pretty slow because it takes it 24 hours to do one lap. So angularly, the moon's slow as dirt. Linearly, the moon is booking. Same with the sun, the earth actually. It takes a whole year to do one lap, but the linear speed is super fast. Question so far? All right. Now I want to briefly explain kind of how these factors work in relationship to the Earth and Moon before we apply them to math. Because this phenomenon relies very specifically on every single concept in all of these formulas 
and it relies on all of them being very finely tunedly balanced. The moon is centripetally accelerating around the planet, and that means it is moving at a specific velocity at a specific distance from us. The moon has a velocity. Whenever it was first formed, it was imparted with some amount of momentum. It wants to rocket off into the void in a straight line. That's what it would do by itself if the Earth didn't exist. That's what all things in space do if they aren't orbiting or colliding with something. And if the Earth wasn't here, it would just be content to do that. However, the Earth is here, and for that reason, Earth's gravity is going to pull the moon towards it and act as a centripetal force. Now, if the moon had no innate velocity, what would happen? It would just crash into the Earth. It would crash into the Earth. This force would literally pull the moon closer, and the moon would literally just fall out of the sky, and frankly, we'd die before impact. There's a million problems with that. The tides would stop working correctly. All the water would rush to one side of the planet. Some people would just fly up towards the moon and suffocate. It'd be a bad time. So good thing that doesn't happen. But because very specifically, there's that force down and also a velocity perpendicular to it, an interesting thing happens. The moon wants to move forward while it's falling down. And so what happens is this, projectile motion. It moves forward and falls down at the same time, like with all the marbles we shot out of those cannons. So instead of going forwards or down, it does both. And it ends up here. That's out of scale. A little better. It did both at the same time. It's kind of a glitch in the matrix. So it did fall out of the sky. It just missed the planet. The moon is constantly falling and constantly missing the planet. Same is true with the space station. The astronauts in the space station are not weightless. They're just falling forever and missing the planet forever. More on that later. So now the moon's here. And now that it's here, something interesting happens. To these vectors, the velocity and the gravity point in these directions anymore. No. No. What direction does the gravity point? Towards the Earth. Towards the Earth. So technically the same direction, but the way that it's drawn, the way that I drew it here by choice, now it points to the right instead of down. What direction does the velocity point now that it has accelerated? Down. They remain at right angles from each other. So those vectors have changed direction. So now the moon wants to go here, and it's trying to also fall this way at the same time. So once again, it's just gonna do both. And it ends up here. You might see the pattern that's forming. Same thing's gonna happen. Gravity now points up, and velocity now points to the right. So once again, it does both, ends up here, et cetera, et cetera, ad infinitum. So the, it just constantly keeps falling around the planet instead of towards it. And space station does the same thing. And the Earth does the same thing around the sun, just takes longer. This is again, trying to demonstrate how very specifically, you need both the centripetal force and the forward velocity to make this happen. If both are not happening, you don't get the circle. That force always has to point toward the center of the, the orbit, and the object always has to have some velocity that points tangent to the circle at a right angle to the force. Without that very specific balance, the system stops working. This is why the moon slowing down is a problem. 
Because as it turns out, I, I keep saying that in space, things are just going to keep moving in a straight line forever until they hit something. Um, and I keep saying that there's no friction in space, but that's not technically true. There's a teeny tiny amount of friction in space, besides the fact that every other space object out there has gravity, so the moon is constantly being pulled around by weird forces that we can't fully calculate. So between tiny space friction and weird space gravity, the moon does change velocity slightly, and it might be trending slower. Over time. If the moon's velocity changes too much, it's going to change its distance from the planet. If it slows down, it's going to get closer. If it gets too fast, it's going to drift farther away. Both are bad. If it gets too close, that's bad for very obvious reasons. But if it gets too far away, then our tides don't work right and the ocean dies, which is also bad. If you haven't learned about tides much, basically the moon is constantly moving the ocean around, churning it, basically literally churning it, stirring it up with the gravity. The moon is literally like slightly pulling Earth's ocean up towards it, and so the ocean is constantly like undulating around the surface of the planet, and this keeps it in motion. This keeps it oxygenated. If the Earth, if the ocean wasn't moving and wasn't being oxygenated, it would just sit and stagnate and die. And we get most of our oxygen from the ocean, as it turns out. We need that algae to not die. At least I think we get most of our oxygen from the ocean. I was told that. I'm not a biologist. So if the moon gets too far away, the tides act up, we die. If the moon gets too close, it hits us, we die. Same is technically true of the Earth and the sun. If we get too far from the sun, we freeze and we die. If we get too close to the sun, we burn and we die. All of these systems are incredibly finely tunedly balanced. So every single number of this formula has to be very specific. And if any one of them changes, the whole system gets thrown into chaos. Questions? All right. Let us apply this information to a very quick example. We're not going to put numbers to the moon and the earth yet because those numbers are huge and I haven't taught you the secret recipe for gravity yet. So instead, we're going to apply numbers to this version. We're just going to swing a rock on a string over our heads. Got a one kilogram rock attached to a one meter long string. Mass one kilogram. Orbital radius, one meter. If the string is one meter long, that would be the distance that the rock is from our hand at all times. So that would be the, or the radius of the giant circle that we create. And the rock's linear velocity, the speed that it wants to fire away at in a straight line, is three meters per second. For those numbers, for this particular orbital balance, what must the centripetal acceleration of the rock be to make this happen? We got two formulas for centripetal acceleration, those being v squared over r and omega squared times r. Each version just kind of referring to if we want to think about it linearly or angularly. 
We've got linear speed, so I'm going to choose this version. AC, V squared over R is going to be 3 squared over 1. So, and someone might have said this, but my ears aren't that great, sorry. 9 meters per second squared. This tells you the magnitude of how much the rock is changing direction every second. Because its actual speed number is ideally not changing, but the direction constantly is. Because if it's spinning in a circle and constantly changing direction, as seen here with the moon, it is technically accelerating because a change in direction is a change in velocity. Now, if that is the centripetal acceleration, next question, how much tension must there be in the string to make this happen? What is the tension serving as in this scenario? What type of force? Exactly. You might have said that. Sorry, my ears aren't great. I've, how many times have I said that today? So, tension is serving as a centripetal force, meaning if we find centripetal force, we find tension. So we figure out how much centripetal force is required to make this happen. That tells us what the tension of the rope would need to be if tension is going to play that part of centripetal force. Centripetal force is equal to mass times centripetal acceleration. So centripetal force is going to be one kilogram rock times nine meters per second squared. So this string has to be able to stand up to nine newtons of force to make this happen. If the string can't bear nine newtons of force, it will break and the rock will take off in a straight line. Any questions finding that number? Okay. Once again, all of these numbers are very specifically balanced. If any one of them changes, some other part of the system has to change as well with it, and that might lead to chaos. To kind of demonstrate, and to refer back to this thing again, I'm going to point out that the rope is actually tied to a force gauge, meaning this thing can tell us the force in the rope. It's not going to be perfect, because as I swing my hand around, the dial does change slightly, but I'm going to try and make it as consistent as possible. So at about this speed, note where the dial is, about where my left thumb is. And if I change any part of this system, something else has to change with it. So first thing I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna spin the rock faster. I'm just gonna make my, you know, turn my hand more and make the plunger go faster and observe what changes. Tension is bigger. The dial maxed out. It moved from my thumb back to zero and stopped. So it went from here to here. So it maxed out to more than this thing can measure. So if velocity rises and radius stays the same, centripetal acceleration rises, therefore the required amount of centripetal force rises. This is why if somehow the moon sped up, it would need more gravity from Earth to stay at that radius, but we don't really control Earth's gravity like that. And as a result, it would just get further away. Likewise, if, well, kind of on the opposite notion, if I keep the speed the same but increase the force, it gets closer. Again, that's why the moon might one day fall out of the sky. Along with most of our satellites, if I'm being honest, because for the same reason the moon might one day slow down, all of our satellites and the space station also slow down. This is not a scale drawing. The moon is very far away. But if I was to try to put the space station and the satellites where they might be in scale, they'd be here. They are very close why you can actually see the planet from their windows. They are very close, and that means they're close enough to the atmosphere that they get more friction than the moon does. There's a, there is a non-negligible amount of air friction on the space station and all of our satellites. 
So they do eventually slow down. Their velocity doesn't stay the same. And if the velocity gets smaller and centripetal force stays the same, radius shrinks. So I'm just physically going to slow down my hand. Ow, that kind of ruined it. All right, slowing my hand down, but not changing anything else. Slowing my hand down. Ow. It's weird, it's a little weird to see because the object does kind of fall while it happens. But notice, you know, if, if it starts doing this number, notice that while it is lower in the y-axis, it's also closer in the x-axis. The radius shrank along with the velocity. All, every single part of this formula has to be very specifically balanced. And once again, this is why things fall out of the sky. If the satellites lose velocity, they're just gonna get closer to the planet. And if you are get close enough in the atmosphere, you just set on fire. If you're specifically falling very fast through the atmosphere. We have lost satellites, you know, million dollar satellites, because they re-entered the atmosphere when they weren't supposed to, fell, and incinerated themselves. And that's sometimes why your cell coverage goes down. That's millions of dollars we just don't get back, because now you're breathing it. It's vapor. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is why most satellites, and definitely the space station, have emergency thrusters. If they slow down, they can turn the gas on for a sec to try to pick their speed back up. Questions? All right. Um, the moon doesn't have thrusters, so if it slows down, we're in trouble. All right. Um, before we break for the day, I want to go back here and I want to acknowledge something interesting, something weird about centripetal force. Uh, I asked earlier if you've heard the word centripetal before, and it's okay if you hadn't. I now also want to ask if you have separately heard the word centrifugal. It's okay if not, I'm gonna teach you about it regardless. Centripetal force is the thing we're gonna be using in this class, the main thing we're gonna be talking about. But occasionally in like common English, some people will refer instead to centrifugal force. This is a different word with a different meaning, but they are tied to each other. And I wanna acknowledge what this is and the difference so that it's as clear as possible why we use centripetal force and not this word. This word, again, centripetal is center seeking. Centry center pedal is seeking. Centrifugal means center fleeing. The centrifugal force is something that you might have felt before that refers to a force that is trying to pull you out of the circle. If you've ever been driving in a car, and say the driver very suddenly cranked the steering wheel to the left, like I said earlier, and the car starts turning to the left. You ever notice how sometimes as the car turns to the left, it, what, what direction do you feel your body get yanked in when that happens? Yeah, kind of, if the car does this, sometimes it feels like you're doing this. Does that sound familiar? Sometimes if you're not the one driving, your arm might even fly out, especially if you're on like playground equipment as a kid, the tilt-a-whirl thing. That phenomenon is what the word centrifugal force refers to. That feeling that something is pulling you out of the circle as some real actual force is actually pulling you towards the center. It kind of feels like something's pulling you out while the car is bringing you to the left. And I want to, I want to bring up centrifugal force specifically 
because I need to point out that it's not real. I'm not arguing with your perception. The thing you felt is real. You felt something happening. I'm not arguing with that. What I'm arguing with is that what you felt wasn't actually a rightward pointing, outward pointing force. You felt something, but it wasn't a force. And that's why we don't calculate this. We calculate this. This is a real number that we can find, a real force we can measure in newtons. But this is not. This is not a force. This is a human sensory phenomenon. So we're, at, we're entering biology territory now. Bio, combo biophysics. We don't measure centrifugal force because we can't measure it because it is a sensory experience based on the fact that you as an organism are not one solid object. You are a bunch of solids and fluids, pardon the terminology here, stapled together inside of a skin bag. What that means is, in this scenario, when the car starts moving to the left, you are a separate object from the car. And your own momentum, your own inertia, doesn't want you to turn left, right? We talked about this with the moon. Your own inertia wants you to go this way, in a straight line. And so your body tries to do that until the car seat that you are physically seat belted into forces you leftward. So there is a leftward force acting on you, the force from the road, the car, the engine and the road act on the car, and then the car acts on you, because you're seat belted into it, wear a seat belt. The car seat drags your body to the left with it, and since you are still not one solid object, if your torso gets yanked this way, your head and your arms have their own inertia still trying to direct themselves in a straight line. So it's not that there's a force pulling your limbs and body this way. They just want to go this way on their own. It's not a force. It's your own innate momentum trying to take you this way. And from your new leftward skewed reality, it feels like you're being dragged to the right when you're really just trying to move in a straight line out of the circle. And frankly, if you weren't wearing a seatbelt and the car didn't have doors or windows, you might just fly in a straight line out of the car. The real force is the leftward pointing one that is dragging your body towards the center of this orbit. What you're feeling, that rightward feeling phenomenon, is again, your own body wanting to move in a straight line, the car is refusing to let you do that, but it feels like you're being pulled to the right. One, because your own inertia wants you to go in a straight line, which is skewed by your new leftward moving perspective, and two, it doubly feels like you're being pulled to the right because your blood is a different object from your limbs. Your blood's inertia wants to move in a straight line. So separately from what your skin is doing, your blood is now gonna press against the layer of your body, trying to move rightward in a straight line. And any force you feel is actually your blood pressing out on you, trying to escape. And you can replicate that just by swinging your own arm around. Eventually your blood rushes to your fingertips, right? like a centrifuge, again, same keyword there. What you're feeling isn't actually a rightward pulling force, it's your limb, your whole body wanting to move in a straight line, the car's not letting you, and your blood pressing against the rightward side of your body. And in turn, your body has to push leftward on your blood to keep it inside of you. is this phenomenon that you experience is based entirely on weird human biology quirks interacting with centripetal force and momentum. So that is why we don't really use this word in here. We use this word and we calculate this word. We can't calculate this because it's not a real force. How do we feel? 
Okay. For that reason, we will continue using the word centripetal. It refers to these formulas and this phenomenon. But we don't use the word centrifugal around here, except to point out that it's not a real force. If it helps, the F stands for fake. And the P stands for pretty real. I guess you don't. Now, once again, lab this week is going to be about centripetal force, so namely these formulas, um, kind of similar to this thing that I've been doing the whole time. Uh, the lab is going to involve an apparatus that spins mass around attached to a rope, and you're going to be measuring tension in the rope and the speed that it's spinning at so that you can calculate centripetal force and compare it to the measured tension. Make sure that the formula works right. So definitely make sure, bring these notes whenever you have lab. And make sure that you observe all, observe all safety rules when, in, when using the machine. Namely, it's a spinny thing, so just make sure you're, anyone with hair doesn't, doesn't fall into the machine. Any questions, needs, concerns, etc. for right now? All right. Um, stay tuned this week for more rotation stuff. Um, let me know if you need anything. Have a great day.